Good morning. About contemporary science fiction, at least one insight, a paradox has taken root. The pro uh, provocative works in this mode often center thematically on possibilities and discontents of the present, that our own predicaments energize many texts that win critical praise and mark attraction. Among these discontents, at least as far back as Stanley Kubrick's 2001, the promise and threat of powerful artificial intelligence has been front burner. Recent big news developments in the field, including Google's BARD, Bing's Sydney, OpenAI's ChatGPT iterations, and coming soon to a laptop near you, Amazon's multi-billion dollar project called Anthrop Anthropic. These all take us back to the HAL 9000, replicants, terminators, Cylons, and the robots of Karl Chapek and Isaac Asimov. All of these are evoked as prophetic about the future in which we are duplicated, replaced, surpassed, not only in intelligence and physical power, but also in what we take for granted, often with self-congratulation, as the inner life, consciousness, the soul, the sublime core experience of being human. Though the technological breakthroughs that excited Mark Twain are mostly mechanical, several of his texts, enterprises, and fantasies are worth including in this cluster. These involve the possible automation of discourse production, and even of creative effort, and near the end of his career, several kinds of human replicas. One text in particular, the last of the mysterious stranger manuscripts, plunges exuberantly into dilemmas that are growing ever more urgent for us now, including this rising challenge to a foundational Western belief in the uniqueness, authenticity, and specialness of the individual human self. From youthful dreams of handy robots to quandaries about synthetic others as existential threats, traceable in a sequence of publications, manuscripts, letters, notebooks, and journals, the progression in Mark Twain's career also recalls a, a classic storyline. It's a variant on the sorcerer's apprentice, technology cooked up as advantageous to real human beings, and then thereafter going dangerously bad. In the Greek myth of Pygmalion, an ancient wellspring for all this, the sculptor creates his marble Galatea, prays to a goddess to give it life, and apparently lives happily ever after with his stone dream girlfriend made flesh. In modern variations, however, Galatea learns quick, grows powerful, and things get out of hand. From about 20 years ago, Jeffrey Steinbeck's essay, Mark Twain's Mechanical Marvels, which was put together by Michael Kiskis of uh, Elmira College and Laura Scandera Trombley, situates um, um, early enthusiasms in, Mark, in a 19th century context of feverish invention. All these new contraptions powered by steam and electricity having spent many years of his youth in small-scale shops centered on manual single-sheet presses and subsequently in mechanized high-volume printing operations in St. Louis, New York, and Philadelphia, Sam saw much to bolster his Tom Sawyer aspiration to farm out drudgery, to contrive a life wherein someone or something else would whitewash the fence, set and justify the movable type and distribute it back into cases, operate the press with requisite muscle stamina, and do everything else that had worn him out and paid him almost nothing in Hannibal. Ultimately, this dream of delegated effort, combined with his Gilded Age ambition to get rich, lured him into expenditures, interventions, anxieties, and bankruptcy, one cause of which was the notorious Page Compositor, which biographers have seen as more than an apparatus for, for type. It's often suggested that the Page was a steel and brass replication with improvements on what Sam himself had been in his flesh and blood uh, adolescence. A do-it-all do journeyman printer, but this time perfect, tireless, uncomplaining, and of course not in some bothersome trade union. From this familiar history, however, Steinbrink suggests connections to an array of non-gadget experiments in con contemplated scenes as Tam Sam tried to evolve from entertainer and sketch writer into author of long, lucrative books and to find shortcuts to move his career along. Two plans went farther than the talking stages. They involved proxy travelers. An Elmira College professor named Darius Ford, that's the fellow in the middle at the bottom, was recruited to circle the globe, gathering facts and impressions and sending them back home, where Sam in Buffalo would rewrite the material and publish in the Express. As a correspondent, however, Ford ran out of steam, and the project ended after only two letters. 
Another plan, worked up with Alicia Bliss of the American Publishing Company, involves sending a friend named John Henry Riley on a tour through the South African gold fields and interrogating him for publish publishable stuff when he returned. By the time Riley had completed the trek, however, Sam's interest had moved on, and when Riley died in the following year, the project died with him. Not too much later, says Steinbrick, Mark Twain psyched himself, this is my words, not his, into seeing his own literary fences as getting whitewashed automatically. Perhaps you remember trying something like this yourself on a long cross-country run in high school or doing a, a rough sports workout and getting yourself through it by telling yourself that you were an unbreakable machine rather than a suffering pile of flesh and blood. According to Steinbrecht, Mark Twain kept at it. Over time, his fantasy altered its accoutrements in his letters and journals, it picks up the conceit of a fuel tank filling up on its own with fresh ideas, and Steinbrink orders, or, argues that this also, this elaborated fantasy empowered Sam for decades after. All right, so the, some quotations are on the board to save time. I'll let you look at them, except I'm, I'm going to read the, the conclusion down here. A writer, this, this is Sam, I and mean, this is Steinbrink imagining Clemens is thinking, a writer was not a, cartisan, a conscious artisan who did a great deal of deliberate work. A writer was not accountable for the logic, the continuity, or the implications of his productions. A writer would not run out of ideas or energy or nerve. A writer was not alone. He had the machinery of metaphor churning more urgently than a six horsepower steam engine to convince him that the books would surely write themselves, that the tank would surely fill. With Steinberg, uh, Steinberg's groundwork in place, we can explore how it might connect to themes that take shape later in Mark Twain's career in writings that reflect our own negotiations with crisis as new tides of innovation roll in to simplify or take over our daily chores, even as they can undermine our cherished intuitive assumptions about what it means to be human. To put this another way, beyond the domains of scholastic philosophy and theology, People who think, seek affirmation in their individuality and self-worth often rely, at least in part, on accumulations of everyday involvements and roles. For example, what we do for a living and the spirit in which we do it. I love or I hate or I tolerate my life as a teacher. I'm a painter. I run a hedge fund. I drive a school bus. Obviously, family identity is, for many of us, a big component along and how, with how and what we create, and the discourse and ideas, whether original or secondhand, that we string together when we try to think about something we regard as important. My point is that when we try to describe in plain language who and what we are, one thing we do is compile. And as the machines around us grow more elegant and our downloaded apps proliferate, they can also usurp, and these compilations can wither. And there's this, too, that in the process by which normal human activities are technologically isolated as well as replicated, think of the swarm of software that now uh, runs our daily schedules, nags us about exercise, buys our groceries, does our banking, and even writes for us. And an idea or illusion of the self as something unique with some kind of transcendent integrity is inevitably challenged by an idea of the self as a comparable array of programmed behaviors and response. In Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, the self in question is Walt Whitman as a cosmos. Alas, Walt Whitman lived in simpler times. What might be more fitting for us now is a song of myself as an overloaded smartphone with cluttered home screens and too few gigs of open memory left. So with regard to Mark Twain's writing and thinking in his final decades, my point is this that in his passionate, turbulent engagements with seductive new machinery, scientific discovery, and one collateral challenge after another to conventional assumptions about personal identity and the domains of the human, his writings resonate with anxieties like these. He represents human beings as subject to replication, duplication, division, and ultimately to extreme reduction. He writes of the mind as imprinted by experience and even copied wholesale like a sheet of electrotype. And he also engages in an, unsett an unsettling paradox that in our classic American quest for personal apotheosis, to be special, to realize our full potential, we might ultimately discover that we're really nothing at all. In, an, in a famous Hank Morgan soliloquy in Connecticut Yankee, we see a flash of this anxiety, a summary judgment that seems to be more than Hank's alone. All right, there's, you, you know this passage here. Can you all read it okay? I'm going to move ahead. <laughs> 
It's one of several famous moments in which Mark Twain or one of his proxies struggles with the what is me question that Derek Parfit spent so much of his professional life pursuing systematically. The uncertain authenticity and transcendence of what we want to think makes us who we are. Parfit's 1984 book, Reasons and Persons, has become one of the most influential works of moral philosophy of the past half century. In pursuing the problem, it engages nearly every big name metaphysician, epistemologist, and moralist in the canon. Because the analysis is long and complex, summarizing it accurately is beyond my reach and well beyond our time limits here. But on the possibility of a transcendent self, what Parfit refers to as the further fact, by which he means some dimension of human nature that cannot be verified on either physical or biological evidence or rigorous logic, he arrives, he arrives at an unsettling conclusion that Hank Morgan's one microscopic atom that is me is not only contingent but also ephemeral. Ultimately, Parfit affirms the so-called reductionist view of personal identity, a rejection of the Cartesian ego, meaning anything pres present beyond the activity and experience of the physical brain and body. Along the way, he countenances the medical phenomenon of the divided brain. When the organ in the skull is bisected by, by injury or by surgery, two different personalities for the same body can be the result. So how many potential microscopic me's are, are in, 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 Hank's, in, Hank's, uh, are in Hank Morgan's body? How much is he carrying around? Parfit also makes much of the fact that every cell in the body and brain is, re is replaced repeatedly in the course of a lifetime that there's no physical continuity in a strict sense, that the soul is, from available evidence, not hiding in the pineal gland, as Descartes imagined, or anywhere else. Am I suggesting that Mark Twain found his way to much the same conclusion before Parfit, and, and did so without recourse to our authoritative sources and relentless logic, and he ended up a confirmed reductionist? The answer is no, and nothing's gained by aggrandizing Mark Twain's turbulent speculations or fitting him out as something that he wasn't. What I want to suggest here is that in writings after Connecticut Yankee, from Puddinhead Wilson and those extraordinary twins through number 44, The Mysterious Stranger, and especially in the later work, Mark Twain does, does engage with similar dilemmas, sometimes darkly, yet also at times in brighter spirits. In these later works, we find indications that Mark Twain experienced, at least now and then, in the intensity of writing, a measure of consolation, even grounds for joy, not unlike what Parfit eventually describes as the psychological consequence of his reckoning with his own conclusions, his difficult farewell to an intuitive belief in a transcendent self. And there are connections to note among Mark Twain's imaginative experiments with duplicate people in the Puddinhead Wilson narratives and number 44, which offers wilder adventures into what we can call artificial intelligence. Invisible beings taking over human work in a medieval print shop, outbreaks of dream selves and duplicates, comedies of mistaken identity, a carnival of characters and incidents packed into a long story where Mark Twain abandons coherence, narrative arc, and other niceties of the craft, perhaps for the sake of trying something else, a celebration of mind and imagination free of life, uh, free of life and creative process without restriction, even the restrictions of one body, one brain one supposedly discreet and consequential self. To see this aspiration more clearly, Parfit's aspirations are useful. From a concluding chapter of, of uh, Reasons and Persons. Can you read that okay? Okay, I'll keep moving ahead here. All right, to go to my next passage, well, all right. I want to I'll read, I'll read what he follows with here. On the reductionist view, personal identity just involves the physical and, physical and psychological continuity. As I argued, both of these can be described in an impersonal way. These two kinds of continuity can be described without claiming that experiences are had by a person. A reductionist also claims that personal identity is not what matters. Personal identity just involves certain kinds of connectedness and continuity when these hold in a one-to-one -one form. These relations are what matter. With that possibility in mind, if we set out from Hank Morgan's grumpy declaration that we have no thoughts of our own, no opinions of our own, and stay on that heading, the next stops on that journey are stories where major characters are constructs fitting that general description. People with blurry identities are, in, are distinguishable from one another in trivial or grotesque ways, or entirely by the effects of, quote, heredity and training that Hank, at least in, in that moment, regards as nearly the sum total of who we are. 
It's well known that Mark Twain wrote Put in Head Wilson as one narrative and then split it in two, boasting about doing so. It's also obvious that when we read the stories together, we encounter three sets of twins. As newborn children in Puddinhead Wilson, Tom Driscoll and Valet de Chambre are essentially interchangeable, underscored by the fact that Roxy, as Chambers' biological mother, swaps them in their cradles and nobody takes note. How they become di such different men proves to be the novel's overarching question, and Mark Twain Strew's possible answers through the tale was stunning indifference to sorting them out. Do bloodlines really count for more than upbringing? Is it the other way around or some combination of the two? No answer. What matters here is this lack of implicit concern with which the supposedly high serious mystery, the foundations and determinants of personal identity, is presented in Mark Twain's narrative. As for the two sets of genuine biological twins in the volume, Angela and, and Luigi appear in Puddinhead Wilson first, first as visiting Italian gentlemen, and then in the amputated short story as twins with two heads and a shared body, differences between them being largely for plot twists in the first story and for laughs and ironies in the second. Though we can dismiss all this as hasty or clumsy writing, it is worth considering whether Mark Twain's indifference here to psychological difference and his attention in both stories to physical attributes as signifiers of personal identity and determinants of fate, the fingerprints in Foot and Head Wilson, the shared body in Extraordinary Twins, suggests a diminishing faith in the me as something unique or transcendent. In later chapters in number 40 for The Mysterious Stranger, we plunge into a funhouse of duplicated human beings and subsequent upsets, not just to daily work, but also to self-regard and morale in the so-called originals. After the invisible ghosts break the union strike in the Austrian print shop, the capricious number 44, with the help, or so he says, of a local wizard, generates a squadron of flesh and blood duplicates, one for August Feldner himself as the story's narrator and one for every other human in the trade. And sharing life with a replicant brings on personal and professional crisis. These duplicates take over your job, ruin your courtships, and even outshine your inner life. I was always cured courteous to my duplicate, but I avoided him. This was natural, perhaps, for he was my superior. My imagination compared with his splendid dream equipment was as a lightning bug to the lightning. In matters of our trade, he could do more with his hands in five minutes than I could do in a day. He did all my work in the shop and found it but a trifle. In the arts and graces of beguilement and persuasion, I was a pauper and he was a Croesus. In a passion, feeling, emotion, sensation, whether of pain or pleasure, I was phosphorus, he was fire. In a word, he had the, all the intensities and, and one suffers and there joys in a dream. For, so in the history of uh, Gilded Age fiction involving AI outbreaks uh, and their moral and psychological consequences, number 44 might make the cut, provided we read the story selectively. For in this final draft of The Mysterious Stranger, it's not a fable and the characters in it, manufactured by magic or anything else, do not advance some consistent theme that human beings are something special, nothing, uh, nothing special, nothing more than Parfit's worldly interaction of brain and body. Such a reading would falter at other moments, including this one from a few pages later. Okay, you can see in this one, he's a bit, he's talking about the soul here, right? Just jumping into a couple of lines here. When I was invisible down towards the end, the whole of my physical makeup was gone. Nothing connected with it or depending upon it was left. My soul, my immortal spirit alone remained. Freed from the encumbering flesh, it was able to exhibit forces, passions, and emotions of a quite tremendously effective character. So here the story swings back to souls and the transcendent me, and no commentary on number 44 has succeeded yet in making these epistemological and teleological excursions add up. By one line of reasoning, however, and in keeping with the tale's apparent connections, unsteady as they are, with a reductionist view as Parfit constructs it, perhaps it all shouldn't add up. Five decades ago, the composer John Cage, spicing up musical non-performances with epigrams between numbers, favored this one. When the situation is hopeless, there's nothing to worry about. If that was indeed a rationale for Cage's vast refusal of tradition and convention in his music, perhaps something similar is detectable in number 44. There is really nothing to worry about with regard to thematic coherence or any other kind of coherence in a non-story that Mark Twain cares to tell. And whether that excuses these occasional junkets into the nature of the self may also be nothing to worry about. 
For in number 44, a quality that steals our attention is its rambunctious energy, its outbreaks of buoyant spirit and festivity. And if in Mark Twain's last years, we can tease out evidence of a reductionist view of human nature, we might recognize that keeping unsteady company with it might not lead inexorably into despair. And that the refusing or evading despair about an existential truth may not in itself amount to a failure of nerve. Perhaps in such moments of serenity or joy, here's one of them, there can also be honesty and depth. Derek Parfit explains how he found his own way to live with what decades of study and his own thinking had brought him to. Is the truth depressing? Some may find it so, but I think find it liberating and consoling. When I believed that my existence was such a further fact, I seemed imprisoned in myself. My life seemed like a glass tunnel through which I was moving faster every year, and at the end of which there was darkness. When I changed my view, the walls of the glass tunnel disappeared. I now live in open air. There's still a difference between my life and the life, lives of other people, but the difference is less. Other people are closer. I'm less concerned about the rest of my own life and more concerned about the lives of others. Boyhood dreams and grown-up enthusiasms, abortive schemes and risky investments in this private, persistent, professional trick of imagining himself as his own mechanical marvel, I'm suggesting that all this may be manifested in Sam's identity crises later in his life as an inconceivable new era gains strength and as our own struggles intensify to affirm the meaning and worth of human life as AI sophisticates and burgeons and closes in, we can bear in mind the free, stubborn vitality of Mark Twain's response on these manuscript pages from his final years.